Thank you. Please stand by. You will now be placed into conference. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Bill Fakui with Page Solutions, and I want to welcome all the attendees to today's webinar. Uh, today is actually because social media is such a broad topic and because there's so many different options out there, uh, there's even a lot of conventions out there trying to share uh, the latest and greatest of what goes on, on on social media. And today we are privileged to have uh, our social media specialist, Cami York Fern, here uh, to pr present on this webinar. Uh, really, we're just going to focus on just one of them at, at, this, uh, at this time, and we will do this for a three-part series to make sure that we not just gloss over the, the, the basic stuff, but really get into some details to how to best leverage each one of these uh, social media, because each of them have a tremendous amount of opportunity for our practices. Uh, so I'd like to go ahead and, first of all, introduce Cami. Hey, guys. And then I'm going to have her uh, start with the presentation. But before we do that, just a little housekeeping. Uh, we are doing uh, a gift uh, every 15 minutes and uh, to all the attendings. We'll be doing uh, drawings. So I will interrupt uh, Cami on occasions just to do that. Uh, but to kind of get the most out of your time, I'm going to let Cami go ahead and get started right now. Ah, well, thanks for, thanks for that great introduction, Bill. I'm very excited to be talking to you guys today about Facebook. There's so much that has changed in the world of Facebook for both users and for businesses, and we're going to cover a variety of topics today. So first on the agenda is I'm sorry, we seem to be having a little bit of technical difficulty with our slides. Okay, I apologize about that. Um, so some of the topics we're going to be covering today are how to maximize your Facebook marketing. Under that, we will include keys to engagement, how to promote your band's best material, key reporting metrics, and how to turn fans into paying customers. After that, I'll move in to talk about Facebook advertising, how you can use can different campaigns and boosted posts to your business's advantage to get in front of a larger audience. And I will finish up talking about content creation tools. There you go, baby. So first, let's just go over a couple of social media metrics. Um, Facebook happens to be the largest social network out of all of the networks available for use. Um, more than 1 billion active users currently use Facebook. Of those, there are more than 2.5 billion pieces of unique content shared each day. That is a lot of opportunity for you to get your business in front of potential customers and in front of your already paying customers. Uh, Facebook, I would say, is the largest opportunity to get in front of this audience, not only because of its size, but because of the advertising options that are offered. <clears throat> when it comes to Facebook and all of their platforms, to be honest, content is king, but engagement is queen, and she rules the house. We all know... Just like in my house. <laughs> Just like in your house. There's something about us women, yeah, isn't there? Yeah, wife rules my house. <laughs> um, well, we all know that engagement is the most difficult task you probably have as a business. Um, you can post tons of content, but if it's not getting engagement, it's not performing as well for your business as it could or as you'd like. So how do you get that type of engagement? Facebook has started to make it a little bit more difficult. Um, as of late last year, um, Facebook had an organic reach close to 16% for most businesses, meaning any given post that you post on Facebook, say you have 100 fans, 16 of them will potentially see your content. Um, we have seen that number significantly drop down into the 2 to 6% range um, early this year which has been defeating for marketers, but also for some of you. Um, 
some of the things that we can do to combat that is pay for advertising. Um, and it's not just small businesses that are suffering from this. Uh, a Facebook expert that I follow regularly, Mari Smith, saw her reach plummet from 50,000 people down to just 3,000 out of her 120,000 fans. That's a drop from 41% seeing her content down to just 2.5. Um, so it's affecting everybody. So what, what exactly, and when you're saying it, the, the exposure is kind of going down through Facebook, what is causing that? What are they doing that's causing that? Facebook updated their algorithm about which um, posts they choose to show in your news uh, feed. Okay, so they're just being a little more selective with what they're, okay. They're being a lot pickier, and Facebook happens to be the only platform that filters your news feed. Um, at any given time, you could see 300 to 400 posts um, out of the 1,500 that are on there at any given time, depending on who you're following. Great. Okay. Twitter Good. and Google Plus don't do that. Good input. Thanks. Um, okay. So let's start off a little bit about talking about how to plan a campaign. There are four keys to keep in mind when starting your planning process. First, you want to think about social listening and how to build your community. That means uh, monitoring what other people are saying about your brand or your business online. So doing a quick search, seeing if you have any sort of reviews, um, and seeing if people are sharing, what types of people are sharing your content, et cetera. And to build your community, um, you'll need to follow other businesses that are relevant to what you do. So for your industries, it would be other lawyers, other dentists, other doctors that perform plastic surgery procedures. And they don't have to be your direct competition, but they're a great resource to use for posting content. If you see that something is working for them, it might possibly work for you. And there's probably some icons in each of these industries that kind of stand out as being really good sources for ideas and stuff. I would agree, every, every one of them that has those. So yeah, I think it's a good idea to not necessarily always do all the heavy lifting and all the brain, brain damage yourself a lot of times. Absolutely, let other people help you out a little bit. Um, the second thing you're gonna to wanna to do in the process is build the anticipation up to the big reveal. So the idea behind a campaign is you're either running some sort of special or you're letting people know about an event you're holding or something that you really want the public to know that is not common knowledge. So building the anticipation will help people come back and keep coming back until you give them the big reveal at the very end of the campaign. Once you've built a little bit of that anticipation, it's time to start offering promotions. What, what, now when you say promotion, and I hear this a lot, um, is you're talking about build anticipation, reveal. Give us maybe some specific, are there specific offers or promotions or things that you know practices should, should consider or what makes for a good promotion? Sure, that's a great question. So some promotion ideas that you could run would be social media only specials. So if you are a dentist, you could run a Facebook special that says, uh, like our page and get $100 off of teeth whitening or come in for the month of April and receive teeth whitening on top of whatever service you're coming in for, if it's your regular checkup or just a cleaning. Um, if you're a plastic surgeon, you could offer specials on Botox or even just money off of a certain procedure for a certain month or a certain period of time. We have found that social media only specials get more involvement than if you share them uh, with everybody. And it makes your users feel a little bit more special. Because they've liked your page, they are getting this promotion or special offer um, that's not available to other, uh, some of your other patients. Okay, so in those offers, should, when you say, um, you know, to our Facebook only or to our, you know, online customers or, or uh, friends or whatever, should, should that be things like coupons? anything like that? Do you encourage that kind of stuff? Yeah, so you can use coupons of sorts. Um, some of the language I might use is mention our ad 
um, mention that you saw our ad on Facebook when you come into the okay. office or um, something similar to what you mentioned. So they don't even have to print something out. I, I think that that's just kind of, kind of gimmicky, kind of have to print something out on, on a, in a day and age when it's all electronic. Yeah, you want to make it as easy as possible for your users to take advantage of your special. And word of mouth is the best way to do that. I would, I would agree with you. Okay, great. And then the last step in the planning uh, portion would be to release your findings. So you could do a case study, you could ask patients for testimonials when they come in for their cleanings or procedures or consultations. Um, you could show how your special um, <clears throat> performed on Facebook. Um, there's lots of ideas behind that, but you just want to let people know, hey, this worked, thank you so much for participating, and then get ready to plan your next campaign. That sounds great. Yeah, and I also find that when you do that kind of stuff, they, they almost become fun for the, you know, for the end users. They actually enjoy, they have a fun time with that. Absolutely, and the idea behind that is you want to add value to your users. Um, you want to make the special appealable to them and applicable so that they will want to keep coming back for your services. So the next topic I'd like to cover is how to maximize your exposure in a Facebook campaign. Once you've done all the planning, it's time to think about some of the logistics. So when you are in the planning stages, make sure to think about um, who your audience is and if the post that you're creating is adding value to them. Um, it's all about your audience. It's about pleasing them, but also about getting business for you. And make sure that all of your posts also help build your community. When you say community, I mean, I hear that word a lot, building your community, but for, say, a, a doctor or an attorney and you're saying your community, what does that mean? And, and how do you build a community? I mean, I've got, you know, I, I do have some people on my Facebook that maybe like me or follow my stuff. Uh, how do you build community? That's a really great question, and it's going to be a little different for a doctor versus a lawyer. So in a lawyer situation, building community could mean connecting with other lawyers in the area or connecting with other lawyers who have influence on Facebook and the other social networks and digesting what types of information they've been posting about and looking at what's worked for them and even starting to engage in that conversation. So you could, as a lawyer, ask another lawyer a question about um, a particular problem that you've been having with a case, as long as it's within legal rights. Um, or you could ask about, hey, I had this situation, how would you deal with this, in terms of some of your marketing efforts even. Um, for doctors, building a community is similar. You would want to connect with other doctors in your area and other people who do this, a similar procedure that you do, but it's going to have a little bit less of the legal ramifications. Okay. Um, and you could, as a doctor, ask questions about um, what is the most popular procedure you perform at your practice, um, just to get an idea of what other people are doing, even. And it's great to build those human relationships at the beginning um, so that you can come back to them and keep coming back to them and use them as a resource later on. Yeah, I would agree. Questions are, you know, making statements or just publishing information is great. But what gets people engaged, to be honest with you, at least the stuff that I look at, the ones that I engage in, is when somebody's asking a question. Let's face it, we all have opinions. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I, we definitely all have opinions about things. And asking a question is a great way to get your audience engaged because if someone feels very strongly about a topic or they have knowledge on the topic that you're asking a question about, they are definitely will want to share their um, thoughts with you. Yeah. So if, if you had to say just, I, I know there's no real hard numbers, if you said, you know, just if as a percentage, say I've got information that I'm just posting and sharing with people and there's other ones that I'm asking questions about, um, is there a percentage? Should I do 50% of those should be questions or, you know, do you have an opinion on that? That's a great question and I don't think there's any set answer because there's no cookie cutter way that's going to work for every style of business. So I think a lot of it is experimenting and trying things. So 
I would first start off maybe trying three out of every 10 posts being a question and seeing how your users respond to that. If they respond well, you can certainly up the amount of questions that you ask uh, and keep looking at that data to see if that's getting you more engagement. I don't think there's any sort of cap. I don't think you can ask too many questions, but I would be hesitant and just start off a little bit on the lower end. Okay. No, that's great. Now, I'm going to go ahead and interrupt us uh, for our first um, uh, drawing. And the first drawing is going to be an Amazon gift card. And that was actually, we're going to give that one away to our, the per person who registered first uh, for the webinar, and that was uh, Charles Rock. So, uh, Charles, if you can just chat on your uh, webinar and just let us know that you're here, we'll go ahead and make sure that you get that. Awesome. Well, congratulations. Um, the next one I wanted to move on to is talking a little bit about hashtags. Um, and you want to make sure that um, the content that you share will look good when your users share it with their fans. Um, the idea is you want to make them, as the user, look good when they share your content with their audience. And that is a little bit of a challenge sometimes because not all content is necessarily shareable. But some content that I would get excited about sharing um, for if I was following a doctor or a plastic surgeon per se would be if they started posting about fitness routines. I am really into fitness and working out. And if my doctor or plastic surgeon suggested a post-operative workout, I would be stoked to share that with my friends. Um, on the legal side, it could be even just a really common question that people have about um, do you charge for your consultations? Um, that realm is a little bit tougher when it comes to asking your users to share it just because of the realm um, and the topics that get covered. But um, there are definitely ideas that you can come up with with that. Um, so in terms of using hashtags in those posts to make them more shareable, you don't want to use more than two or three in your post. More than that, and it becomes a little bit spammy. And definitely include hashtags in the middle and end of your post rather than at the beginning. Okay. You know, one question, and, and, and to, to be honest with you, I'm not a, uh, the most uh, literate social media person, and it, didn't, it wasn't until recently that I even knew what hashtagging was. Uh, you hear it on all these things, but give me an idea for those people that are not using this. When you say hashtag, what is a hashtag, and what is it that we're trying to do with them? That I'm so glad you asked that. So hashtags are a way to um, make a key, key term searchable. So you tag certain words, um, certain key terms in your post, and that in turn becomes searchable on both Twitter and Google. Um, so if I was making a post um, about fitness, you would want to keep your keywords that you've defined for your campaign in mind and use the same two or three keywords to hashtag them. So I would make my post, have my content, um, and let, let's say it's about working out. So I would probably hashtag the words workout, fitness routine, um, gym, terms that are related to your post that you think people would search. And it's a great way to show up higher in the searches. It's not a guarantee, but it certainly can help you. So I like to think of Twitter as a mini search engine, and that's kind of where hashtags started. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I've, I've heard it related mostly to Twitter. I didn't know if it was uh, associated with other ones. Um, it is associated with Facebook as well. It is not as popular, but it does have the same effect. So if a person was searching for a personal injury attorney on Facebook and you had recently used hashtag personal injury attorney yeah. in one of your posts, you are more likely to show up in their Facebook search for that term. Okay. So it's basically just putting the, the number symbol in front of whatever word that you want to. Now, do you want to put a space in there or is it adjacent, right adjacent next to it? It is right adjacent next to the term. There should be no spaces. And it's really nice with Facebook. When you put a hashtag and start typing, it will highlight it blue for you to let you know that it's a hashtag uh, and not okay. part of your actual content. Gotcha. Great. Okay. Good. Um, and then my last recommendation would be to have a dedicated content creator who can post and respond to your comments. So whether that's someone in your office or someone outside of your office, um, it's important to have someone monitoring that and keeping, making sure that your campaign is staying on target 
and reporting back to you about how things are going. When you're, when, say for example, I have somebody in the office that say, okay, this person, I want you to be, because they really like, I mean, in a lot of our practices, we find that there's one or two people that really, I mean, they're doing this already. I mean, and they, they like it. They, they, they are social media people. Um, how often, because I, I also get the doctors and attorneys that say, well, I don't want them spending all day in this social media thing. I mean, give me an idea or, or the audience an idea of what kind of time should be going into this? How frequently should they be doing this? Are there, do you do it just so many times a day? What, do, what should we be doing? So the best practices for Facebook that I would recommend is no more than once per day. So that would be a max of five to seven times a week, depending on if you want to post on the weekend. And I would say for the general person trying to manage Facebook, you could take care of that in 10 or 15 minutes a day. Okay. Um, and the nice thing about Facebook is they also have a scheduler. So if you want to spend a little bit more time to plan out all of your content for the month, mm -hmm. you can certainly do that in advance. That way you're maybe sitting down for two hours at the first of the month and getting all of your content created for that month. Or you can do it day by day. You can do it week by week. But I would say it takes 10 or 15 minutes a day to manage a Facebook page. That's, you know, that's reasonable. I think where a lot of practices get kind of consumed by this, they, they're thinking it's, out, you know, an hour or two a day to do this, and, and that's really not, I don't think that's the objective there. That can certainly be a little overwhelming. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about reach. Um, reach is a constant concern for a lot of people. So how do you get the most reach when you post? The, some of the tips that I would have are don't be afraid to post outside of business hours. A lot of your fans um, go online when they're in the car ride on the way home. I know that's a little dangerous. You should never <laughs> text and drive, but the truth is that a lot of them do get on their phones after they leave the office. Um, a lot of them are also on their tablets or smartphones when they're cooking dinner at home or when they're watching TV right before they go to bed. So a lot of it's not always when they're in the office. It could be lunchtime. It could be dinner time. It could be right when they wake up in the morning before they come to the office. So I would just say don't be afraid to experiment. Yeah, I, it's interesting. I would just got back from a convention, and uh, when I speak at these meetings, uh, Everybody says, well, I'm inaccessible. I'm at this meeting. I'm not going to be accessible. And guess what? They've got 10 minutes between courses, and that entire 10 minutes between every one of these courses is filled with them being on their smartphone. I looked out into the audience. There was like 50 people in there, and every one of them had their phone up. I am <laughs> like certainly going, guilty of that. So. I'm like, oh, yeah, you're not accessible, but yeah, you are. But you are, <laughs> sort of. Um, so also, listen to what people are saying about your brand. I talked a little bit about that earlier. Um, the term for that is social listening. So you can actively go in and do that by doing a Facebook search. And you can search for your business and see what types of posts come up. You can even do a Google search to see if people are talking about you on networks outside of Facebook. And it's important to hear what they're saying because most of the time it will be reviews or testimonials that they're giving you. And that could even give you topic ideas. But testimonials and reviews are also a great opportunity for you to showcase your audience. And people love being highlighted for something positive that they said about your brand. And those are one of the um, more popular posts on Facebook in general are testimonials and images. No, I think that's great. You know, the one of the things that I do find with reviews I think the, the the one area I think a lot of our a lot of practices and businesses fall short on is they're so quick to respond to a negative review, but out of the 50, 100 positive reviews, they do nothing to those people. And these are the people that are saying good things about them, and they don't even acknowledge that they even saw them. So I I, I think that staying on top of that stuff is is critical. It's definitely great to highlight the positive things that are being said about your business. To that note, another way that you could mention or highlight your fans is to tag them in a post. And on Facebook, uh, you can do that by starting to type their name into your post. And Facebook will search through all of your current fans, and it will find and see if they are a fan. And then again, 
highlight their name in blue if that's the case, and it will send them a notification that they have been mentioned in your post. It's a great call out. It's a great way for you to highlight and let them know that you appreciate them. On Twitter and Google Plus, you can do the same thing. We'll talk about the, that a little bit later in the other webinars I'll be giving. But you can do the at mention or you can tag them with their plus name. Okay. Hey, you would mentioned in the previous one, uh, it says 120 character in terms of optimal on all, that, that means all platforms, meaning all the different social media. Why 120, I, I know that Twitter has limitations. What's the, what's the idea or the strategy behind 120 characters? So people have moved into scanning articles um, instead of reading the whole thing. So the shorter you keep your information, the easier it is for your user to understand exactly what message you want to get across to them. The longer it is, the less interested they're going to get and the less engagement that post is going to get. So for Facebook, we recommend 120 characters, which is about two sentences if you keep them a little bit shorter. But um, then attach an image to that too, and that will help get super engagement. Yeah, I would say you know the, you know people think of being a good writer, you have to write a lot. The best writers are being able to get a message across with with fewer texts or certainly fewer characters. Absolutely. That's, that's great. Okay, super. Yeah, the best writers are the ones who can say what they want in a short, concise amount of space. So one thing I did want to iterate again is that it's about your audience, not necessarily your business. I understand at the end of the day you want to make money from this, and that is that can certainly be a goal of yours. But when you are posting on Facebook, you want to appeal to your audience. And the more you appeal to them, the more they'll like your stuff, the more they'll share it, the more engagement you'll get, and the more visibility you'll see overall. So you want to let them know all of the social sites that you are on. If you're on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Tumblr, Pinterest, you want to let them know about all of that. That way you have the opportunity to reach everybody because you might have fans who are on Facebook, but they're not on Pinterest. Or you might have fans who are on Pinterest, but not on Twitter. So you want to make sure that you're letting them know everywhere you are so that you have the most opportunity to get in front of as many eyes. Also another tip I would give you about appealing to your audience is limiting self-promotion. I like to use the 80-20 rule, meaning 80% 80 of your content should be non-self-promoting content. The other 20 is allowed to be promoting content. Promoting content being things like encouraging people to like us on Facebook or like this post and non-promotional content being just sharing information and tips that don't include a solicitation. Um, also, my last tip would be to drive traffic to a specific Facebook post rather than just your page in general. We've started doing this for a couple of our clients and seen a ton more engagement when it comes to that. So when you po point them to your page in general, it's still great and it's still really helpful if at the end of the day your goal is likes. But if you point them to a particular post, you're pointing them to something that you have an interest in and you're hoping that they will have an interest in as well. And that at the end of the day is more what users want to see. Rather than scrolling through an entire page's worth of content, maybe just point them to the post that you made today about divorce laws um, or updated divorce laws, something like that. And they will be much more engaged and excited by that. You know, keeping kind of that in mind, Cami, what about uh, when you're in social media? I, I, you know, there's so many different platforms, and I also include blogging with that. When you have your own blog and, and content that's on your blog, uh, that kind of stuff. So, so the idea would be rather than just, and we say this to the website, don't just drive them to, a, to your home page. You want to drive them to specific topic areas of your site exactly. or – if somebody's asking a price about something, probably a good idea to send them to your financing page, you know, things like that. Exactly. I, I would agree. That's a good idea. So Bill makes a really good point. When people are searching online on social media and even on your website also, they're searching for a particular answer to their problem. They want to know a specific topic. So whether it's they're searching for 
the cost of your procedures or your hours of operation, that's a very specific piece of information. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to go ahead and interrupt you, Cami. I've got our second uh, giveaway, and this is a Best Buy gift card. And my assistant, Kelly, has drawn a name, and it's Rick DeVault. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, D-E-V-A-U-L-T. So, Rick, if you can go ahead and chat in, I'll make sure that you get that uh, sent over to you. Thank you. All right, now let's talk a little bit about Facebook advertising. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, a little while ago, had a quote that said, ads are as relevant and timely as the content your friends share with you. And that just meaning ads come into your feed and go just as much as your friends update and post. So it's hard to keep up with those as well. But like I was saying earlier, Facebook is making you pay now to get in front of your audience. You know, what's interesting when people talk about ads in social media or it used to even be on, you know, there was a time when Google didn't even have AdWords and it was just purely results, which was great. But I think as people use different media, people get, you know, they're used to seeing TV, you know, ads on TV. They're used to seeing ads. It's no longer just, you know, a negative to have uh, those AdWords work. Absolutely. You know, statistics show that they do work. Um, we we generally tend to say early in the internet, oh, it's not about ads. But as consumers start becoming more acclimated to ads and used to seeing them, the more creative, the ones stand out. You know what? They do interact with them now much more than they did before. It is all about advertising on Facebook now, and an interesting statistic that I discovered yesterday. When we have done a boosted post or some sort of likes campaign for a client. We have seen up to a thousand percent increase in reach and engagement numbers. So advertising is a must now on Facebook. I just wanted to cover how different users see different ads. So Facebook has two different styles of ads that you can see in your newsfeed and on the right hand side. So because of the inundation of mobile and because it's become so popular, Facebook decided to create a newsfeed style ad and also a right hand style ad. Keep in mind that the newsfeed ads are larger. They appear just like you would see a post from your friends in the newsfeed, but will show up with the tagline sponsored on the top. That's how you can distinguish an ad from a post in your newsfeed. Those st the newsfeed ads will show up both on your desktop and on a tablet. But the caveat is that Facebook also created a right-hand side column ad, which is much smaller. The image is only 100 by 100 pixels. You still get the same number of characters, so the copy will be the same, but it just appears much smaller. That will be seen on desktop, but also on mobile phones. Mobile phones will only see those style of ads. So it's important to keep your audience in mind. I think that's really um, a good idea in the sense that the, what makes the difference between this and say, uh, you know, Google AdWords is there's no images associated. There's no branding value um, with the exposure on Google AdWords where on this stuff, you know, people are actually seeing a message even if it's subliminally, even if they don't go to it, it's, it's visual branding which is great. Yes, it is definitely important to keep your mobile audience in mind. Oops. So some of the styles of Facebook ads. So I talked about that Facebook distinguishes between newsfeed and right-hand column. Facebook offer also offers you different types of cam ad campaigns that you can run. And you can see that in the image on the right-hand side. The main styles of Facebook ads that we use are the page post engagement, which is basically a glorified boosted post, which we will review in just a minute. Um, a page likes campaign, which is a campaign to get more likes to your Facebook page. A clicks to website campaign, which the end goal is to take users from your Facebook page to your website. And then website conversions, which requires you to set a certain goal. Um, an example could be if you just recently wrote an ebook and you'd like people to download it, you can do a website conversion campaign 
point them to the thanks page for that ebook on your website, and Facebook will track how many people came from Facebook to download your ebook and actually convert it. That's great. That's great. Hey, speaking of which, you got in here, um, you're talking about budgets, you're talking about the types of ads and stuff. Um, I'm going to jump right to the question that everybody's going to have. What's a budget? Nobody really knows what a good budget would be, and it's kind of sometimes people feel like, well, the marketers are just pulling that out of thin air, uh, or it's based on their commission and stuff. Uh, you know, and, and I, I don't think that that's, you know, true. Give us some ideas how, how you go about what is a typical budget or how do you determine that? Sure, and that's actually a really tough question. So budgets are going to vary and depend by what type of campaign you're running and what the ultimate goal of your campaign is. For example, if you are running a page likes campaign and you want to get 200 more likes, your budget could be somewhere between two and $300 and you could run it for one to two months, okay. and that will most likely achieve your goal. The more money you spend, the more eyes you're going to get in front of, and the larger your reach will be. Okay. That's what I try to tell people when they ask about what type of budget should I have. We always discuss what the goal is first, but then also how many people do you want to see your ad. Obviously, the more you pay Facebook, the larger audience they're going to give you. Right, and actually you kind of kind of piggybacking off of your previous comment about, say, for example, a goal. A goal would be how many downloads that you get that came through Facebook. Obviously, if that's a goal, it's going to require a lot more eyeballs than just likes or just exposure to actually get to conversions of of that. So, yeah, I can see, you know, the, the goal is probably the bigger um, variable. Absolutely. Depending on what it is that you're wanting people to do, because obviously some of them are going to require much more engagement, much more, you know, more than just exposure. Yes, and one other point I wanted to make is that location is also a variable. If you live in a smaller town or a smaller area, you're not going to have as many pot potential people who are on Facebook in that area. So say I live in Los Angeles. That is a huge city. Uh, there is going to be potentially one to five million people that you could reach with your ad, depending on what interest you give. But if I'm talking about Boulder, Colorado, that is a much smaller city than Los Angeles. So you're going to have to pay more, and you're going to have to be a little bit more broad and okay with being broad in terms of your audience there and defining them. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I, I think you can probably, the, the scary side of being in a market like Los Angeles is you can eat up exposure really fast. You can, <laughs> and that's a great point is that the larger city you're in, you either have to get more defined with who you're targeting your audience to, which I will talk about in just a minute, or you would just have to be okay with running through your budget a little bit faster. Okay, great. So to kind of piggyback on that conversation, we'll talk a little bit about boosted posts. What a boosted post is, is a regular posting that you make, but you put a little bit of money into it to boost it in the Facebook rankings algorithm so that your fans see it, but also people who are non-fans see this one post. The caveat to boosted posts rather than ads is that boosted posts only run for a day or two. Ads can run for a month, two months, or they can be ongoing. Um, so boosted posts are for a very short period of time. Okay, so that being the case, you know, I, I just I'm just off the top of my head. Why would I want to do a boosted post if the you know if it's only for a short period of time? What's the benefit? What would why would you do a boosted post versus say an ad? Some appropriate content for boosted posts would be if you are running a special or you have an ebook that just came out, or you're hosting an event and you want to let more people know about it than just the network that you're already connected to, that's a great way to use boosted posts because you can add the image along with your content to the boosted post, boost it for say $50, and the reach could skyrocket to 15,000 people mm -hmm. rather than just maybe 80 of your followers. 
So the idea behind that being you're reaching people in your area who might be interested in coming to your event gotcha. or downloading your ebook who are not currently fans uh, of yours. Okay, that that that's actually a good that's a that's a good differentiator. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, also, with boosted posts, don't be afraid to experiment. So the frequency that you do boosted posts depends on your audience. I know some people get a little irritated by advertising and hate seeing advertising in their news feed. It's just something that we're going to have to get used to. So you don't want to do boosted posts every day. I would say maybe do one a week at the most. But most of our clientele only have a special or an ebook or something special like that every month. So I would say that's once a month is probably an appropriate. So that would be a good goal. So if you had some promotional thing. Uh, to just make sure they're staying in front of this audience and uh, and actually in increasing your reach through bo boosted ads, boosted posts. Absolutely. Um, that would be a good goal. Maybe once a month have something. Think through it. It looks like one of our users uh, typed in a question about how many people will we reach with boosted posts. That's a great question. And again, like advertising, it's going to depend on how much money you put into it, but also what demographics you define as to where you want the post to appear. So the nice thing about boosted posts is you can create a custom audience and import that into the boosted post so that you're targeting people either from an email list or people that are already fans of yours that you have permission to advertise to. But you can also reach people who are not fans of yours. So again, the larger your budget and the longer you run it, the more reach it's going to have. I can't put a specific number on it because, again, it depends on your location. Um, this example that I have on the right-hand side was for an attorney in Florida. This particular boosted post, I believe, had a reach of 25,000 plus people. And like you can see here, it got 40 likes and four shares, and there were, I think, six comments below. So that is a great example versus if we had just posted this as a regular post, it probably would have gotten five or six likes, one share, and we'd be lucky if it had a comment probably. Well, wow, that's, a, that's a big difference in engagement, and, and that, I think that's the key is the engagement. That's, that's a lot different. Absolutely. So it could be anywhere from 10,000 to 100,000 people. It really depends on how much money you put into it and, again, where you live in the country. Um, I've got a question here about generally, say, a cost. Give me an idea of just a range. Is there a range of a boosted, what it costs to do a boost? So there's no minimum per se that you have to put into a boosted post. I believe Facebook asks you for $5 as a minimum which honestly, that's not going to do much for your business. I would recommend starting at $50. Okay. We have seen that get quite a bit of good engagement okay. with just $50, and we run it for a day or two. Uh -huh. um, certainly, you can do more. Okay. If it's a special or an event that you're really hoping to get the word out about, I might spend $75 or $100. But for the clientele that we have, I probably wouldn't recommend going over $100. If you're going to go over $100, I would point them more towards doing some sort of advertising campaign that promotes the same thing. Gotcha. Okay. And then you did mention that you can kind of somewhat segregate who you're kind of like a direct mail piece where you can kind of identify who you want to send yeah. it to through some criteria. Okay. Great. Super. So moving on a little bit from boosted posts to advertising and talking about what metrics we should be looking at. So I'll go over what metrics are offered first, and then we'll talk about what metrics are most important. So the metrics for boosted posts and ads are the same, typically because a boosted post and an ad, Facebook have deemed the same style of post, so they want to give you the same type of data. So the top metrics that Facebook reports are ad spend, either by post or by ad set, depending on if you're doing a boosted post or an ad, ad results meaning how many likes, how many comments, how many shares, et cetera. And that's going to depend on the goal of your campaign. So like I mentioned earlier, you can have a Facebook likes campaign. The ad results then are going to focus on how many new likes 
you've gotten from that campaign so far. Whereas if you're doing a website clicks campaign, that ad results column is gonna show you how many clicks to your website you've gotten as a result of your campaign so far. Facebook also reports reach, which in my personal opinion and also the opinion of many Facebook experts is not the most important to consider in the success of your campaign. Yes, it reached five or 6,000 people, that's great. But at the end of the day, you have to think back to your goal um, at the beginning of the campaign. Uh, they will also report on frequency, meaning how many times people saw your ad on average, clicks, obviously how many times people clicked on it, and your click-through rate. Some of the more advanced metrics that you can get into, I showed in the screenshot here. Uh, you can break it down by ad placement performance meaning you can see how well your newsfeed ad performed versus your um, sidebar ad, and you can compare how it performed on desktop to mobile. Um, mobile ads tend to perform better than desktop ads, actually, because of the popularity of mobile, and it has just skyrocketed, but mobile ads also will cost you more cost per click, um, which I actually think is not a bad thing. I would rather have a mobile ad seen by more people and have it cost me a little bit more than have a desktop ad that doesn't reach as many people but only cost me, say, 70 cents per click. Um, also, the example that I gave here is demographics. You can break it down by age and gender. So you can tell how many women you reached and how many men you reached and what age group they're in, and that really helps break down the targeting for later so that you know, okay, <clears throat> the most popular audience from this particular ad was females 35 to 60, four. And that way you know next time you create an ad, that's your biggest audience, um, and you can use that in the future. And also, just by unique metrics, what I meant was Facebook will provide two versions of each metric usually, meaning it will provide you the clicks number, but also unique clicks. So clicks, or that just general number will aggregate all of the data that you get, so all of the clicks that came into that one ad. Unique clicks means how many different unique people clicked on that. So it will generally be a number that's a little bit lower than the clicks general metric, but again, that's helpful to see how many unique people came and saw your ad. Basically new people, yeah. Hey, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you. I've got our third uh, drawing, and that's going to go to Natalie Smith, and that's a Barnes & Noble gift card. So, Natalie, if you can just chat in real quick, we'll go ahead and uh, finish up with the rest of the webinar here. All right, we've only got a few more slides, so hang with me. I uh, appreciate you guys taking the time to listen today. So, we'll just finish up with a little bit about metrics, go into cr um, content creation tools, and I'll do a quick, quick wrap-up. Um, so one of the quotes that has stuck with me for a long time is something that Mari Smith said in one of her blogs. Stop focusing on page likes and people talking about that. Those are two metrics that people seem so stuck on and they matter a lot to a lot of people. So the reason you don't need to worry so much about page likes and what people are saying is <clears throat> because page likes are just a number. Um, you could have a thousand page likes, but maybe only 500 of those are true fans. There are some services that um, buy likes for you um, and do a little bit of black hat when it comes to Facebook liking. So generally speaking, across the Facebook world, likes are not considered super important. I would say they are something to look at if it's not increasing when you run a campaign or if it's not increasing over time, yes, that can be problematic. But overall to look at the fact that you don't have 500 um, page Facebook likes, I'm sorry, um, is not that huge of a deal. So what metrics do matter? Traffic to your website. So are, you, are people coming to your Facebook page and in turn, um, getting to your website. So one of the things that, one of the ways that you can do that is include links in your postings that link back to blogs on your site or link back to pages on your site. 
the more that they come to your website, the more likely it is they're going to convert through your mini form or contact form. Another way to measure success is the growth of your email list. Have you gotten more emails from people who have come in to see you, whether that's for a legal consult consultation or a dental checkup? Um, SEO is kind of a broad metric to define or measure, but are you showing up better in search results? Um, that's just something to consider. Click-through rate, again, a good click-through rate would probably be anywhere between 1% and 2%. We've seen click-through rates between 05 and even as high as 5% for some of our clients. Again, that depends on what type of campaign you're running. Um, finally, ROI, that's a huge one for everyone, I believe. How much revenue has been generated as a result of these campaigns? One way you can measure that is by having a specific goal. So I'll go back to the ebook. Say you've just written this amazing ebook that you want to share with people. You promote it on Facebook, you run an ad for it, um, it gets quite a few clicks to your website, but only 10 people converted. You can put a number to those 10 people and say, okay, the 10 people who converted and downloaded my ebook actually turned into $100,000 cases. So the $500 I spent on Facebook advertising, I well made up for in the fact that I had cases come in. Um, also increased ad performance, just making sure that your numbers are constantly increasing. And finally, uh, positive reviews. Love that. Got to love positive reviews. You can never have too many of those. All right, let's just take a look at your brand versus Facebook ads and how you can combat that and work together with Facebook. Making sure that you're targeting your customers, um, so use what Facebook calls custom audiences to drive traffic to your site. A custom audience is something Facebook allows you to create through a tool online and you can tell Facebook these are the typical kind of people that come into our office for consultations or procedures make a lookalike audience for me of people who look exactly like my current audience but are not current fans. And Facebook will clone your list into people who don't like your page yet but look exactly like the people who do so that you can market to like-minded individuals. That's pretty awesome. It's pretty new, so it's still in development. Um, it's, we've used it once or twice and have seen good results from it. It's definitely something to try out. Um, and then just that point below that, Facebook will build an ideal audience for you, and that's what I was referring to by the custom audiences. Give me an example, Cami, in terms of when you say, you know, a custom audience and building that. How does that relate to the ad? Give me an idea when you say a custom audience. How does specifically, you know, how can I improve an ad? Sure. So a custom audience will help better define your audience so that you're reaching people that are more likely to convert into your business. So when you run just a typical generalized ad, Facebook will push it out to people, say we're advertising again in LA, um, people, um, and you define that you just want to create an ad for people who live in LA with a radius of 25 miles. Facebook will take anybody within that 25 mile radius not dependent, it doesn't matter if they have your style of business listed as an interest on their profile. So say you're a plastic surgeon and you're running this ad, they don't have to have plastic surgery okay. listed under their interest. Facebook will just push it out to a generalized group. Custom audiences help target that group down a little bit to make it so that the people you are targeting are more likely to come in and convert in your office and are more likely to have an interest in what you do. Gotcha. Okay, so it's a conversion element. Yeah. Spending at the right place at the right time. Absolutely. Okay, great. Uh, Facebook versus Google Analytics. If any of you have looked at your data from Facebook and in Google Analytics, I'm sure that you've seen there's a bit of a discrepancy. The reason is because Google Analytics will only give you direct referral traffic. So unless they came directly from Facebook and didn't go in a roundabout matter, Google Analytics will not count that as a visit from social. So Facebook is a lot more 
lenient about that, but also a lot more accurate when it comes to the pathway that people took to get from Facebook to your site. Um, so Facebook can tell you who converted within a date range. Facebook can tell you who converted and where they went. So that's pretty neat. Um, in general, I would trust Facebook Analytics over Google Analytics when it comes to social reporting. Um, anything outside of that is uh, outside of my knowledge today, but I would say Facebook reporting is more accurate. Great. Um, and then just the last point about um, your brand versus Facebook ad placements. The sidebar will not provide as many conversions as the news feed. That's okay. That makes sense. It's a smaller image. Um, it's not seen by as many people, not, to, not anything to worry about. Um, and again, no surprise, mobile newsfeed ads are the most expensive in terms of cost per click, but they're also the highest converting. Yeah, I think like anything else, if it offers more value, obviously it's going to be a little more expensive. But Absolutely. Because we're targeting a pretty niche audience, uh, and the more niche you can be, the value of that, you know, exposure on, on that is, is worth every penny, I think. Uh, Absolutely. You know, I think we're just not trying to market to anybody, so I think that's great. Um, so, once you have designed your campaign and come up with an ad for it, what are some tools you can use to generate content to fill up your page outside of the ads you're running? I've listed four sites here that I really like using on a daily basis and then just a short description about what they are. The first one, Content Gems, is a site that monitors more than 200,000 news sites, blogs, social media accounts, and will sort them into topic areas based on keywords you enter in. So it's kind of like doing a Google search, but it just filters in news sites, blogs, and social media accounts. Feedly, I also use on a daily basis. It's, these are all free too, by the way. Um, so Feedly is, it will follow RSS feeds and sort them into its own RSS feed for you so that you can see the newest and latest content of sites and RSS feeds that you consciously follow. Um, Sponge will sort out articles into main topic areas to peruse. This one's a little bit more generalized, so it could have fitness as a category um, lifestyle topics, health, those type of things. Um, so that's a really great, great resource for more generalized content. And finally, Paperly, if you've heard of it, you can kind of create a personalized online newspaper and choose from different sources that you want to read stories from and what types of stories you want to read. And Paperly will deliver that to your email every day so you can peruse and see if there's any topics that you want to post about today. All right, so just a few key takeaways from the presentation before we open it up to questions and wrap up. Don't be afraid to experiment with your strategy. This is something I can't stress enough. With social media, there is no cookie cutter way that's going to work for everybody. The only way you're going to find what works for you is by trying posting on different days of the week, posting at different times of the day, posting on different topics, um, switching up your content types. So post some images, post a couple videos, try a text update, and then compare those and see how they perform against each other. Images are um, generally going to perform better than any other style of posting on Facebook. But again, just experiment and see what works for you. Also, talk with your audience, not at them. Social media tends to be sort of a one-way conversation. You want to open that up and make it more of a two-way conversation and utilize some tactics that Bill was talking about earlier. Ask questions. Don't be afraid to say something like, join our conversation in the comments below, or leave your opinion in the comments and let us know what you think. Any way that you can solicit their opinions and ideas, they're going to appreciate and you should see a benefit from that. Also, 92% of marketers have said that social media increased their brand exposure in 2013. 
I don't know how else to say it, you need to be on it. It's something that you need to take advantage of. It's free. It doesn't take too much time. Like I said earlier with Facebook, you can spend 10 or 15 minutes a day working on it and have an effective business page. But social media is definitely something you don't want to ignore. And finally, it's not always about how many fans and how many followers you have. It's about how you can make them turn into business. So at the end of the day, just think about what things, type of things you're posting and how that can ultimately help your business make money. Great. Hey, Tammy, we're right at the end here, and we did answer some questions in the middle. I invite you to, to send us more questions. We're right at the hour. Uh, I'm going to give away our last uh, uh, drawing, and that's going to go to Karen Kramer, and that is for an iPad Nano. So, Karen, if you can just chat in real quickly before we end the webinar, that would be great. Uh, and do uh, look for us, uh, and we will be posting the webinar. This uh, We've recorded it. We will be sending it out. I would ask you, we will have uh, an opportunity for you to engage with it as well. So we're going to have you uh, share your opinions on the content that Cami shared with you today. And if you like it, I encourage you to do that type of stuff and share it with others uh, that can also benefit with this. Uh, you certainly don't want to be the person that's hoarding all this good information. So make sure you share it with everybody. Uh, thanks again, Cami, for sharing this uh, really informative uh, webinar on Facebook. We'll be doing our next webinar on other social media platforms as well. And thank you guys so much for taking the time today to listen, and I have really enjoyed presenting to you. I look forward to your feedback. Have a great rest of your day. The chairperson has disconnected. The conference will now end.